Hi guys, I'm Felissa Rose, Angela from Sleepaway Camp, and you're listening to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Review Podcast. I hope you enjoy it. And meet me at the waterfront after the social. Mwah. In a world where zombies, ghosts, serial killers, and vampires all exist, it's Nico, Brian, Mike, and Dustin. And they are all that stand between you and the films that could end the world. Welcome to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Just want to thank all of our fans and listeners. We really appreciate all support. You guys are awesome. Before we get into tonight's film, I just want to give a quick shout out to our website, don'tgooutthere.com. My man Brian has done a fantastic job with the website. He's got it looking great. Everything about our podcast is on there. All of our episodes and interviews from episode one to our weekly release. If you want to check out all of our episodes there, maybe you have an office job, don't have access to your phone, you can listen on your desktop computer. We've done some incredible interviews in the past with some of the biggest names in horror, uh, some of your favorite slashers, uh, writers, directors. Check out our interviews if you haven't heard those yet. We got our store. We got some new T-shirts. Uh, Brian and Dustin have done some fantastic designs if you want to check those out. And we also have Shan's Etsy page attached as well if you want to grab a Tumblr. And we also have our social media, fa- uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Uh, we love interacting with our fans. We love you know meeting new people. We love answering your comments and questions on the air. So definitely check us out on social media. And the last thing I want to shout out is our patreon we call it blood donors we have the traditional monthly reoccurring kind you're a big fan of our podcast a big fan of our show you want to help support us that option is available and we also have one-time donations if you want to donate and you know have if you have a film review you want us to do that option is available as well all right let's jump into the uh, film review this week is brother mike's pick i gave him the subgenre of slasher because i know he's a big slasher fan i'm really excited about this film review mike uh, you want to announce your pick and why you picked it Yes, I picked 1983's Sleepaway Camp. I almost went with Sleepaway Camp 2 because it seems to be more popular and more beloved, but I feel like we're going to do the Sleepaway Camp thing in order because we normally don't do that. Every time we have a franchise, we've we've covered it all over the place. So I feel like starting with the original was the way to go. We haven't done a movie in this this, uh, franchise yet, and it felt like, you know, it's summer, so it's the right time of year, and it was just one of those... You know, big movies, you know, those cult classics that we haven't covered yet. So that, that's why I decided to do it. I don't have a preference either way on this movie. Going into it, I was a little, uh, you know, on the fence. So I am excited to talk about it. But it's not, I didn't pick this movie because I love it. I picked this movie because it was finally time to go ahead and cover it. I'm with you. Uh, this is a movie I hadn't seen until last year sometime. I just picked a weekend and I watched Three different movies that I hadn't seen. I watched uh, Wolf Creek, Sleepaway Camp, and Cabin Fever. You know, I didn't think Sleepaway Camp was anything too special, but, you know, a couple months later, I got to meet Felissa Rose at Spookalo, the first convention. She's a, she's an incredible woman. She's super nice. Um, took the time of day, you know, to speak in depth with me and took picked some really cool pictures. So that experience will help my review a little just because of how nice she was, even though that might – shouldn't count but fuck it it's my review uh the movie itself i'm going to be honest and say that i think it has a good charm to it It has a really good 80s feel uh the camp is nice the uh there's just a lot of things i like about it you know we're living in 2023 now a lot of kids you know they're not going outside and playing around having fun with their friends anymore it's all social media online playing video games from each other's house i i enjoy just watching you know kids having fun outside at camp and I think the one big thing that hurt my viewing pleasure is seeing, already knowing the ending twist. But if you go into it completely blind, I think that's a really good twist. I'm not saying this movie's perfect or that I love it or anything because, I mean, it's got some pretty bad acting. The kills could be better. You know, there's not a lot of logic in some of the kills. The B kill, for example, just crawling under the goddamn stall. But I think the movie is okay. I mean, I think it's definitely one that every horror fan needs to watch it at least once and, I'm excited to talk about it. Go ahead, Brian. A hey, fun fact, this is the movie that always comes up for me on those quizzes when it tries to, you know, pair you with movies from your birth year. Uh, but yeah, I've I've never really cared for this movie. I hadn't seen it since Creel and I went through our horror binging summers when I was younger and I didn't like it back then and I still don't really care for it now, but 
as an adult, I'm able to appreciate a lot of this that I used to really not. Uh, but on the flip side, I also recognize how fucked up a lot of it is. And I wasn't able to <laughs> recognize that as a younger kid either. Uh, looking at you, Robert Hilzik. There's a lot of John Hughes-esque qualities to this that, that I do really like and appreciate now in, in this day and age of everybody being offended. Uh, this movie would never get made nowadays. And that sort of rarity kind of boosts the movie up for me a little bit just because you know there's a lot of realism to like how the kids act and, and things like that. That, again, is very John Hughes-ish. Uh, we've tried, oh, I don't know, probably a dozen times to get Felissa Rose on the show. I've had her scheduled probably five different times to have something come up with her schedule. Still love to have her on. I've never met her like Nico, but she seems to have a amazing, you know, personality um, from interviews and interactions that I've had with her, uh, you know, trying to get her on the show. But yeah, so I've gone from not liking this movie at all to kind of, eh, it's, it's fine. It's whatever territory at this point in my life. Um, I was not looking forward to this review, but I'm glad that I've, you know, revisited now that, uh, we got the chance to. Yeah. I, uh, I hadn't seen this movie until I watched it for this review. And, um, I kind of feel like Mike owes me for making me watch it. I'm not a fan. I, I sent y'all the clip. While I was watching the clip from the movie, the ringer when he said, I've seen better acting in porno. Yeah. That's how I felt. The acting was pretty bad. <laughs> um, I feel like, I mean, it's, I feel like it's a layup story wise. There's a lot of meat on the bone there. Um, pause and it just, it could be much better than it, much better than it was. Um, the twist was cool, but I'll get into it when we do the scene by scene. Um, it was very excessively, uh, revealed, if you will. Um, you know, I, I can understand why it's a cult classic. Like, I can definitely understand if you, grew up watching it like it's it's a pretty cliche horror film um there's a lot of things like you just kind of expect it's not that scary but there's a lot of violence in there or there's a lot of kills and so it, it's not bad in that regard it's just um acting wise i think took me out of it so much where i was like man what the hell am i watching i don't i'm not in a rush to ever watch it again so re re really quick nico before you go this movie is definitely in the age of ripoffs so, like, how we talked about on this show, you had Halloween, and then Friday the 13th is a self-admitted, the original one anyway, is a self-admitted Halloween ripoff. You know, this one kind of rips off Friday to the 13th, so it's a ripoff of a ripoff, and it is very paint-by-numbers. And I don't necessarily think that makes it a bad film. It just, you can definitely tell we have a, we have a summer camp, we're going to get a bunch of kids here, and we're going to kill them. The twist, to me, is what makes this movie a cult classic, like... Without the twist, man, this, I mean, it would be pretty a forgettable film, I would imagine. Yeah, the this old dick good. twist, we'll get into that, don't worry. <laughs> but, uh, no, I mean, look, I completely, I'm on, I'm in a little bit of agreement with Brian and Dustin, where the first time I saw this movie, I hated it. It was hard to get through. For this review, have a little bit more enjoyability with it, just because I felt like it was a little more fun. But uh, to Dustin's point, there's there's so much like of course this is so predictable and, and you know so I you know my opinion sits somewhere right in the middle of those two where it's just like this movie is okay but I don't know if I ever need to watch it again if that makes sense like I don't know if I have enough fun with it to where I'm like eh I think I can skip this one now I am excited whenever we get to cover the sequel because I do remember liking that one a little more it's just been probably. 15 years since I've gone back and revisited. Excited to talk about it. Nah, this is definitely one I think I'm going to watch once a year, I think, just during the summertime at least. It's fun, and it's got some great one-liners. Eat shit and die, Ricky. <laughs> it's got some good well, lines one-liners in one-liners are great, for sure. <laughs> All right, guys, you ready to jump into the scene by scene? All right, in fond memory of Mom, a doer, title call with a loud score and opening credits as we get visuals throughout a summer camp. Camp Arawak is for sale. We're on the lake now as Peter tells their dad to tell Angela to stop. Dad says maybe someday to wakeboarding and summer camp. Angela pushes their dad into the water and it's all playful. A man yells out to John, the doctor's on the way and they need to get, they need to go meet them. The wakeboarder yells to them to pay attention as the boat drives right towards John, Peter and Angela crashing into them. The wakeboarder is hysterical saying they're going to die. 
Eight years later, Martha yells out for Ricky and Angela. She, she got them some goodies for the ride up to camp. Martha's extremely odd, <laughs> tying a string around her finger to remind herself of something she forgot. She brings the paperwork of their physicals and says, don't tell anyone how she got the papers. She wishes them a good time telling Richard to take care of her little girl. The bus is pulling to Camp Arawak. Artie is checking out the young girls being a creep, and Ben brushes it, brushes it off seemingly. Paul and Ricky shake hands, and he introduces him to Angela. Paul tells Rocky about Judy's new physique. She and Ricky were steadies last summer. Ricky shows Angela around and calls out for Judy. She blows him off. He takes Angela to her cabin and goes to talk to Judy. My man gets curved again. Judy goes into the cabin, and Meg tells everyone to get unpacked quick and introduces them to Cindy, the complaint department. Angela is staring at Judy, who calls her out. Everyone thinks Angela is weird. We're in the cafeteria now eating lunch. Meg brings Ronnie to Angela, who hasn't eaten anything or talked in three days. Ronnie takes Angela into the kitchen to find something she will eat. Ronnie asks for Artie, and he's super creepy. Ronnie asks him to find her something to eat as he leaves to take a call. Artie takes Angela to the walk-in food closet. Meg makes fun of Angela to Ronnie, and he leaves to find her. Artie shuts the door, calling her a sweet-looking cupcake, and he unlatches his belt. Ricky walks in, asking, what's he doing? He slams Ricky into the shelves. Ricky and Angela run out. Artie stands on a chair, checking on the boiling water. Ben leaves, and Artie salts the water for the corn. POV shot as someone walks into the kitchen and hides. Artie walks, walks back in and stands on the chair and salts it more. The person pushes Artie, and he falls forward. The chair is then pulled from under him. He pulls the boiling water pot on him, burning his flesh up. He screams in agony as Ben walks in in horror. Artie is taken away in an ambulance as the doctor tells Mel he doesn't have a medicine to stop his pain. Mel wants to brush this all under the rug, and he pays Ben and the kitchen staff to keep him quiet. He thanks Ben and tells them to get dinner going. All right, Brian, that's the opening set of scenes we got. What would you think? Um, only because we get it so abruptly to start out with here, I wanted to bring attention to Edward Billow's score in this movie. It's very 80s. Uh, it has a lot of Exorcist and, and Hitchcock vibes to it to me. I haven't really seen any of, the, any of his other work besides this, but since the movie kind of takes on its, its own character vibes in this, I, I really wanted to point him out, too. Um, this open is pretty cheesy, unrealistic. I mean, just how close to the shore they are with these boats and how bizarre it is with the skier screaming over those weird shots. But the most unrealistic thing, the fact that they expect me to believe that Pops was just laying down, relaxing with two little kids, just sitting there being have. Are you fucking kidding me? Has this writer ever even seen kids? Fuck out of here, Robert Hiltzik. And look, I know Aunt Martha is make or break for a lot of people and Desiree Gold's acting choice here. But I just ask, what the fuck? Like, it's like this weird 20s and 30s acting style, but like some over the top caricature as well. It's just, it's so bizarre. And if, you know, as Cody Leach called her, the make or break of this movie, it's break for me. I mean, the quicker we can get her the fuck off my screen, the better. And uh, speaking of bizarre, is this movie the reason why we never got actual kids out of camp ever again in summer camp movie until like, you know, Jason Six for like two seconds? Because what the actual fuck with all this pedo shit? I mean, the the cook, Artie, where I come from, we call them baldies. What? Like, I'm not even sure what to say about that shit. Like, oh, my God. I will point out, though, that the other cook, Ben, is Robert Earl Jones, James Earl Jones' dad. And wow, at how much they sound alike, because that's crazy to me. Growing up, I honestly thought that was James Earl Jones. I mean, hell, I didn't know. But, uh. Are you kidding me here with like Ron taking Angela to see Artie and leaves her with him? I mean, I mean, on purpose, right? Like it sure seemed like wish.com AC Slater here was like feeding this dude on purpose. And we almost get a rape. Like, what the fuck is this movie again? I'm glad they killed her off. I'm glad I killed him off early. Like shout out to Al Edward French too, as well for the effects. Fun fact for Artie's severe burn sequence. The actor was propped up on a fake floor and underneath, liquid gelatin was pumped through the blisters, giving an impression that they were pulsating. The kills are pretty fucking creative. I will give them that, especially for not really having the budget, as we'll hear later, to kind of really show them all. But, I mean, I guess he really didn't die, but the burns looked fantastic, I think. So, props to French and his team there. But kind of going back to the John Hughes aspect, Christopher Collette's Paul, I think, reminded me so much of a young Anthony Michael Hall, if you've seen a lot of those older movies. Uh, Colette didn't do a whole lot in his career, but for Nico, 
I'll point out that he was in Pokemon and voiced a lot of characters there. Fucking nerd. But anyway, I do like the way that it uh, put, <laughs> portrays early teenagers and their dialogue, you know, their hormones, that whole thing. That's realistic. And I've always liked that about, you know, Hughes movies, for example. And I like that for here as well. Um, I don't know. That sounded kind of arty esque creepier than I wanted it to. But, you know, here we are. I love the uh, I love the well, excuse me, bitch line from Ronnie, like right off the bat. That kind of lets you know, like what kind of movie you're getting cracked me up All in all. I mean, it's a decent group of scenes. Yeah, I actually kind of like this little opening credit scene. The problem is it's like fall outside with all the, the leaves that are different colors. And we're about to get a fucking summer camp movie. Like, I guess that's true. I don't know if it's trying to show that the camp is deserted now or what the fuck. But it was, I don't know. I thought it was pretty strange. Uh, but again, I like it because I, I just like fall scenery. So, yeah, that's fine. Um, however, just coming in, I can tell I'm about to get a Friday the 13th for Bob, which I've already talked about. Like, you can just tell by the way there's a camp. There's the, the, that mood, that atmosphere right as we get into it. I'm about to get, and, if, and we're on a lake, you know, right off the bat. I knew that, okay, we're about to get, you know, pretty much a rip off here. But anyway, um, man, the dad falling into the water is one of the worst movie falls I've ever seen. And I'm sure, again, because of the budget, which I'll get into later, he had to do his own fall. You know, no stunt doubles or anything like that. But some of the worst acting uh, that we've covered here, in my opinion. Now, again, we covered worst movies, at least to me. But some of the acting in this movie just really doesn't hold up. It it it, it falls so quick. Uh, the dad and the kids, and I hate to you know criticize child actor because that's really not fair. But again, not a very believable group of people here. Uh, it, you know, especially with you know once we get into the skiing accident and the boat, uh, everybody involved in the, in the actual boat and the skiing is so un unrealistic. It's it's just choppy, like you know you know like Brian mentioned, nineteen twenties and thirties acting. I can't stand it. Um, now, and how many times is this one girl going to say, Hey, lighten up, will you bro? That, that girl said that more than I say, call me sometime, which is, uh, pretty amazing. But the MPAA, or I guess it could be the budget, but I'm going to go with the MPAA because I like blaming them for stuff. They didn't really fuck this movie up that bad where that they couldn't show almost any kill ever, like a single kill. <laughs> None of it. Like, even the shower stab that we get later is just weird cuts. So I don't know if that's the MPAA. I don't know if that's the budget. Maybe it's a combo of both. I'm not sure. But, look, this mom, weird as fuck, right? And you can just tell that something's off, especially when you find out what comes later. You can tell that something's really, really off here with this woman. Although, I am going to take a, a page out of her book and start saying, isn't that nice of me? Hmm. After I do the minimal amount of effort, because she did that. And got away with it. So I figured I'm going to start doing that and see if how, how my wife likes it. Hey, I took out the trash. Isn't that nice of me? Hmm? I feel like that's a good way to get brownie points there, right? That, that'll work out great. Brian, you mentioned this camp staff. Buddy, it's just a bunch of fucking... Uh, I feel like everyone there is a pedo. Like, it's one of those things where I can't tell, is this just that 1980s where all this is acceptable? We're just going to be okay with this? Or what's going on here. But you get the chef. And I'm glad there's at least some movie from this time that makes the pedo a bad guy. Because sometimes you just get these like weird, you know, 70s, 80s movies where there's people underage. And that's just what it is. Not here, man. And it's a very creative kill. Except the fact that it's not a kill. It's just pouring boiling water on this guy. And we don't actually get to see him die, which would have been satisfying i do like the kills in this movie though they're very creative um and, and i think that adds a little charm like nico mentioned to the movie also i wouldn't mind working at this camp because apparently you can drink on the job see some miller high life cans see some miller light cans all right man i'm all in on that if we could drink on the job good stuff um last thing when this camp owner tries to bribe these kids None of these motherfuckers are going to ask where this chef is. Not a single one wants to know where this pedo chef has been. So I feel like him making a big deal about that was completely unnecessary because no one gives a fuck about this fat piece of shit. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. All right. So uh, there's something about the immediate title card and that score that it just feels right. 
I, it's, it feels so appropriate for, for not only the, uh, not only the era, but also the genre. Like I, I really like that. Okay. Now that the good stuff's out of the way. Um, now the opening, the opening shot, like the opening, I guess, kill. There's no way they didn't realize that that boat was heading right towards those kids, right? That's come on. That's not even feasible. They didn't turn at all. If you look at the people in the boat, the backdrop never changes. And so they're going the same direction every time. They just happen to end up going towards these people. Um, so that was annoying. And then the slow reactions once they realized, oh, shit, we're heading towards these people. Let me turn the wheel. Nope. Accelerator. Get the fuck. Out. What, what, what was that? What, what? And then everybody Thank just you. looking instead of doing anything. And then the, the person on the ski just screaming like that. Holy shit, that was annoying. Like I, I was just immediately in a bad mood, not looking forward to the rest of the movie because of that. Um, as annoying as that scream was in that whole scene, that wasn't as annoying as the the mom or the aunt in the next scene. That lady couldn't act for shit. You mentioned the acting style, but Jesus, what are we doing here? Um, and then we got, like you mentioned, the pedophile, the the cook. Holy, like we're we're off to a promising start. I'm just I'm. I'm over this movie already. Uh, and I, I think the most satisfying thing that we've covered, though, on this show is him getting just absolutely destroyed by the boiling water. That was awesome. But, man, I'm honestly, when I was watching this, I was trying to keep a keep an open mind, and, I, and I'm still, like, skeptical but optimistic. But, man, we're off to a rough start. I didn't, I didn't care for this opening set of scenes. We're in the boys' cabin now as Ricky gives a motivational speech to a blindfolded kid on the ground. Mind over matter. He counts to three and the kid sits up into another kid's bare ass. The boys get dressed and head out to play baseball. Billy and Ricky shit talk each other and game commences. Billy's up to bat and more trash talk to Ricky. Moats makes a lucky catch while not paying attention. Ricky with a game-winning double play. We're in the dance hall now. Billy says we need more babes. Don't want a skinny dip with all the dudes. Two guys walk up to Angela and invite her to go swimming with them. She sits there quietly, ignoring them both. Mel walks in creepily as Ricky and Paul walk in, too. Ricky squabbles with the two guys messing with Angela as a big fight ensues. Mel just watches on. Paul walks over to Angela and chats with her. He says sorry about her family and tells her about how much trouble he and Ricky always get into together. He has to go and says goodnight. She tells him goodnight, and he's thrilled. Judy gives her the evil eye. Billy is trying to get the girls to skinny dip as he and the boys strip down and jump in the lake. Kenny asks if any of the girls want to take a canoe ride. They decline and say Leslie is coming down. Ask her. Kenny and Leslie are out in the canoe and he starts to rock the boat. It flips over and she's pissed and swims away. Kenny is under the canoe saying Leslie's name over and over. The guys laugh at the girls as they leave. Someone appears and dunks Kenny's head underwater, drowning him. The guys leave Kenny in the water thinking he's just joking around. Next day, the lifeguard is pissed from all the chairs in the water. He finds a canoe and flips it over, revealing Kenny's dead body with a snake crawling out of his mouth. His body is taken away, and the cops tell Mel he thinks he drowned. Mel is trying to play, play it off as no as foul play happening. Mel leaves to call Kenny's parents with the unfortunate news. Ronnie tells the cop he remembers him being a good swimmer. His body is taken away. A volleyball game ensues as Paul sits with Angela. He asks her if she'd want to go to the movie with him in the rec hall. Meg walks up to Angela and says if she doesn't participate in activities, she needs to sit quietly, not talk to boys. Another counselor comforts Angela. Aunt Paul walks Angela to her cabin, and Judy shoots Ricky down. Paul takes Angela behind the cabin and kisses her. He asks for another, and she says she has to go now. He tells her goodnight, and she goes inside. Judy tries to sweet-talk Paul, but he leaves her. The boys play a shaving cream prank on Moats, and he pulls out a knife. Gino walks in and takes the knife from Moats. Gino tells them all to get in bed, and the boys all jump on Paul. Paul covers Angela's eyes, saying, guess who? She plays it off as Judy walks up, calling them lovebirds. Judy goes to Meg, who asks, why isn't she getting in the water? Can you swim? Meg snaps in anger, shaking her, and Ronnie stops her, saying he wants to see her in his shack. All right, Brian, so next set of scenes I got, what'd you think? So the biggest positive I take away from this group of scenes, really, is that it just feels like a summer camp. Kind of what Nico was talking about in his open. It's just something that most movies don't ever accomplish. Um, and I think a lot of that is because of this, but I also appreciated the softball set of scenes and the dance scene for that reason. Like, even though it felt like if you're watching it, that it went on a little too long. I mean, it's just that gave the whole atmosphere of a summer camp even more 
And I really, I really liked that. That softball scene had some of the best lines ever. I mean, <laughs> this guy blows dead dogs. He shouldn't die. He shouldn't live. That's one of the best exchanges in any movie ever. Um, now, there was this kind of disconnect, though, that I felt like it had with the older counselors and the, the kids. Like, they were kind of running this parallel thing. I don't know. I want to say storyline. But, you know, they were kind of trying to give you some character development on both sides with both groups. And the counselors just didn't really work for me for some reason. Like, the whole skinny dipping scene and then the canoe scene. I know it's just a way to get another kill in there. But, I don't know. It just felt out of place to me. And, like, how, in retrospect, how is a fucking kid doing all this stuff? Like, especially this scene. Come on. Um, anyway, a little fun fact here. While filming the scene where the canoe flips over in the lake, John E. Dunn uh, cut the top of his hand open against a sharp rock on the lake bottom and had to be rushed to the hospital. But I don't know. That whole thing just seemed the most bizarre to me. Um, hey, Leslie, see any water snakes out there? Fucking Florida Gator fans, am I right? Uh, I, I did laugh my ass off with the... Uh, old dude losing his shit before he finds Kenny's head, uh, which, yeah, I mean, the head didn't look all, I mean, it didn't look, I want to say it didn't look all that great. I felt like it looked pretty good for practical effects in 1983. Um, but the snake crawling out of it made it. I thought that was really great. Uh, but that dude losing his shit is me right there. I was crying and laughing at that. That was the funniest part of the movie to me. Packer Woods. I don't know. He was just, uh, I thought that was hilarious. I don't have a lot on this set of scenes. The rest of this set of scenes to me is pretty forgettable. Really. It just, it's more camp stuff. But again, I do appreciate that. Uh, it sets that camp atmosphere, and I liked it. Go ahead. Yeah, I tend to I tend to agree. The set of scenes has a lot of that, like just kids interacting with each other, filler stuff. I mean, but it kind of is, you know, like Nico mentioned, a little bit of the charm of the movie. I will say, I know we're heavyweights. Great film, by the way, much better than this one. Got the old sit up into the naked ass scene from that is always a great trick, and. and like I've said, and I say it again in this set of scenes because we get it. The naked, or excuse me, it's the next set of scenes. The naked male ass is always hilarious. I'm sorry. It's just the way it is. There's no, I mean, that's just standard form around here. But anyway, I like this baseball or softball scene. I think it's really fun. And actually, the, the, the softball part looks better than a lot of sports movies I've seen where the, where, you know, baseball or softball looks like total shit. It looks like they're actually playing a game of softball. There's some good double plays happening and stuff. Like, man, I'm a big fan. I think it's, you know, a pretty fun scene. Probably one of my favorite scenes in the film. But I will say this one group of, quote, unquote, kids that looks like they're about 25 years old lost to this set of kids that looks like they're about 13 years old is insane to me. Like, that is so unrealistic. I can't even, I can't wrap my head around it. But, I, I mean, look. Everyone's messing with Angela, and I get that's kind of the point, the bullying aspect, but, like, we just left the quiet, weird kid alone when I went to summer camp. Like, you didn't want to play with us? That's cool, man. Like, you go off and you do your own thing. Like, there was a kid I went to summer camp with one time who, not Pokemon, just wanted to play with his Digimon cards. That's fine, man. You want to go play with your Digimon cards? I'm not going to stop you, bro. <laughs> I know, that was a bl hey, Digimon, a hey, I was okay. I didn't know where you are going with that. <laughs> Digimon, Digimon. And by the way, I mean, I'm sure that kid went on to be a great productive member of society or school shooter. Whichever one ended up happening, I don't know. But anyway, oh, I'm sorry, sorry. But anyway, look, <laughs> I'm not swimming in a lake at night, so that's number one. So if you try to get me into a lake at night, I'm going to beat your fucking ass. It's that simple. I'll go swimming in a lake during the day, but I, I will not do it at night. Too much crazy shit in there, especially if me, I'm from Florida. Our lakes aren't clean and nice like these other lakes. They're full of fucking reptiles and swamp monsters and all kinds of other shit. So absolutely not doing that. Uh, <laughs> this is another death I wish we could have actually seen a little more of. Like, I know we get the drowning aspect underneath the canoe flipped over, but just like the actual struggle, I feel like what would have made this movie a little less camp and a little more just like make me buy into it. I will say the water snake kind of running through the mouth at the end was a pretty nice touch. Judy. Hi, Judy. Who the fuck wears a T-shirt with your fucking name on it that big? That, I well, Now, I wasn't alive in the 80s. Is that something people just did? Okay, well, you're wearing the shirt of another man's name. That's, that's I don't know what to tell you there, buddy. <laughs> but, uh, look, I, I don't understand that. Style choice, that was something in the 80s and I missed it, then please correct me. But I, I just thought it was hilarious. 
Um, if I were Angela, I would have I would have gotten that volleyball and hit it right in their face. That would have been a really good, you know, especially with the twist we found out later. She could have came down hard on those motherfuckers. But look, look, the whipped cream on the hand into the face is never not funny. It's a little bit of a childish sense of humor for me there. I found that fucking hilarious, even though I knew it was coming. So, again, not much, but just some normal camp interaction here. But I think, you know, the acting, pretty poor, but I think it's fun. Like, it's a little bit of a fun summer camp movie. But it's, you know, like Dustin mentioned, it's open. It's not scary. It's just kind of like the fun summer camp movie. It feels like Ernest goes to camp to me so far. <laughs> oh, come on. Give Jim Varney more credit than this piece of shit. Well, first of all, I love Ernest goes to camp, so let's <laughs> let's not go there, pal. Uh, the softball, softball scene, I agree with what you're saying, Brian. Like it, it, This opening part of this set of scenes definitely encapsulates like what it feels like to go to summer camp, and like they did a great job at that. But, man, it was just excessive. The softball scene was like it, it went on forever. But. This guy blows dead dogs. That's a, that's a hell of a line. Like there's some some good dialogue in here. Um, and Ricky, you know, Ricky stepping in to defend Angela, uh, getting escorted out, and Angela doesn't even bother to pick up his cowboy hat once it falls off. Like it's ungrateful. Like it, it's just, you know, w- women just don't appreciate things. You know, like his his cowboy hat just laid there in the floor, and they just left it. I don't unforgivable. I didn't like it. Um, and then, but man. My man Kenny went out like a hoe. That's all I'm saying. He didn't fight back at all. He just accepted being drowned. Like, there was no struggle. No one knew what was even happening. It's just like, you go under the water now. And he's like, okay, I go under the water. What the fuck was that? Jesus Christ. Um, And, and this Mozart kid, <laughs> he can sleep through a tornado. What the hell's going on? All the lights are on. They're all standing over him, talking in their normal voices. And he's still just like... I'm just going to sleep and let you do this shaving cream prank. Was he reading a porn magazine too, by the way? I mean, I don't, I couldn't, I couldn't tell what those pictures were that was like laying on his chest. And I was like, what the hell is that? I didn't even notice that. I'm not sure. I'm not going to go back and watch it, but I'll take your word for it. Um, <laughs> shout out to Angela also for guessing Florida State Seminoles little legend, Burt, Burt Reynolds. Like that was awesome. Guess who Burt fucking Reynolds? Yeah. Uh, I know Nico loves smoking the bandit. He's seen it. That's one of his favorite movies. He's seen it a lot. Um, great it movie. Just, it is a great movie. I, you know, I think I had more fun with this set of scenes because after the first set of scenes, I'm just like, God, this is gonna be a fucking rocky road. But this exactly. one's got some good comedy to it, so I'm just like, okay, I see what's going on. Judy walks into the cabin after a shower, saying Angela got Meg into trouble. She throws a pillow at her and asks why she doesn't take a shower when they do, asking if she's queer or something. She asks if she's hit puberty and jokes she hasn't got her period. She's a carpenter's dream, flat as a board and needs a screw. Angela leaves to go to see Ricky. The boys throw water balloons at Angela from the roof and Ricky runs over and cusses them out. Mel runs up and tells the boys to get off the roof. Mel tells them all, no canteen for a week, all of them. He catches them again, they're getting kicked out. Mel tells Angela to go change before dinner. Billy has to take a dump before the baseball game. A POV shot traps him in the stall with a broom handle. We see a bee's nest placed in the stall from the window behind him. He panics and can't get out. He cries out for help. He finally breaks the handle, but he's dead on the ground, covered in bee stings and bees all over his face. Mel says he's finished. He asks Ronnie how many are left. 25 kids left. Parents aren't going to send their kids back. Mel thinks it's Ricky. Angela's snooping around until she's jump scared by Paul. She thought he was the killer. Paul thinks it's all baloney. He takes her to the lake so they aren't caught. She pushes him down and runs off. He chases after her and gets her down. He kisses her and cops a feel. She ain't feeling it as he keeps kissing her and she blankly stares into the sky. We now see Angela and Peter giggling as they watch their dad in bed with the man from the lake. We now see a shot of the brother pointing at at the sister in bed in a rotating shot. Angela yells no and takes off running. And Paul is confused. And I am confused at what I just watched. Next day we're playing capture the flag and Gino explains the rules. Paul apologizes, asking if he did something too wrong. Angela pushes him away, leaving him confused. Judy walks up, seducing Paul. Ricky runs up to Angela with a capture the flag strategy. She agrees to help him, and they cut through the woods. They split up, and Ricky catches Paul with Judy. Now Angela catches them and takes off running. Paul chases after her, and Judy laughs. She calls Ricky jealous, and he shoots her the bird. At the lake now, Paul sits with Angela. She's stoic, and he apologizes sincerely. 
She ignores him, and Judy walks up antagonizing. She says, Paul called Angela a prude. How about a little swim, Angela, she asks. Mel talks to Ricky about how, how his summer is going. Angela gives Judy a desk there, and Meg walks up. Meg picks her up and heads towards the water. Ricky tries to save her, but Mel grabs a hold of him. He accuses Ricky of killing the others. Meg throws Angela into the lake. Ronnie gets Mel off Ricky, and he goes to help Angela. They walk off the dock, and the little kids throw sand all over her. They sit down, and he calms her down. All right, Brian's next set. It seems I got. What'd you think? If this movie could not get any more nuts, uh, pun intended, because actually it can get more nuts. But now we have a counselor slapping the shit out of Judy. Like, dudes are having a water balloon fight on the roof for some weird, bizarre reason. And a 13-year-old kid going on a, by the way, it's pretty funny, where it's cock-sucking rage rant, where he said cocksucker at least 25 times. But, you know, then we get another almost rape with Angela getting felt up and then going into a flashback of seeing her gay dad with some dude in the bed as she escapes in her own head after telling Paul no and he doesn't stop. Like, this movie has gone off the fucking rails. But anyway, in this set of scenes, we do finally get another death scene, although not very realistic. A broomstick isn't fucking holding this dude in the toilet stall, especially when he could have crawled under it, like Nico mentioned in his open. But since the camera shows, as pretty much stays, showing his pulled-down pants on his shoes there, the dude doesn't have any underwear on. This fucking movie is gross. Like, this, it's just disgusting. Put on some fucking underwear. There's way too many schlongs running around out here today. But, uh, yeah, I hated this kill. Although the after effect is a very good job well done. I thought the whole thing was was pretty dumb. Um, the movie does do a, a decent job here of making Mel the red herring. I will give it that. My son and wife walked in while I was watching this and both actually pretty quickly said, oh, he's the killer. Um, in fact, that whole scene where him with him shaking the shit out of Ricky, it kind of overshadows this a little bit where the kids throw sand on Angela and the counselor calls them little monsters because I had no idea that that was a setup for the next set of scenes when they all get killed until I literally saw it on our YouTube review I watched. Other than that, I, it's a pretty forgettable set of scenes here, honestly. Yeah, so this bitch Judy threw a pillow at her and took it right back. <laughs> I cracked me. I was like, here you go. I'm a bitch. And then she's like, give me my pillow back. Bitch, you just threw it at her. I, I don't know. That made me crack up for some reason. You mentioned, Brian, that this movie could never be made today. Um, uh, our girl Angela here gets a queer accusation thrown at her. Would never stand a chance of being made in this context. Uh, that, That's the least that, thing that this movie yeah, does that wouldn't right, be made. Right, right. <laughs> uh, you know, I will say, Judy here deserved to be slapped. So that was a let's fucking go moment for me. Uh, I know we shouldn't have, you know, abuse on children, but fuck Judy. She deserved to get a little slap to the face there. I, every time I see this older group of guys, you know, they're throwing water balloons and being jerks. They really look like they're in college to me or older. Like some of them just look really fucking old. And so it's just I have a hard time buying into the fact that they're at this summer camp with all these kids. Um, I do like some of the shots that we get when we're setting up kills the music that plays, the way the camera works. Like, they do a pretty good job using the budget the best they can to create a sense of dread or a sense of we're about to get a kill. So I do like that. But again, we don't actually get to see the kills. Like, we do see the after effects, but we don't see the kills happening. And so that, again, just with 2023 lens on here, that kind of drags the movie down. You guys hated this B kill. I didn't mind it as much. Uh, I actually really liked it, and I know it's really stupid and illogical. They didn't just crawl out from under the stall. But I guess in that moment of freak-out panic, I don't know what I would do. I'd probably crawl out from under the stall. But uh, I kind of am willing to forgive it because I thought, it, one, it was fucking hilarious. And, two, the after effects looked so good, like it didn't bother me that much. I thought it was a very creative way to kill somebody off. We get a jump scare here, which I don't know how, like, prevalent jump scares were in horror films at the time, but this feels like one of the first and I will forever blame. Now that I have seen it again, I will forever blame sleepaway camp for having all, all these jump scares in every movie. So thanks a lot. Sleepaway camp. Um, yeah. So they like, don't know how to like use the character of Paul to me. Like 
they keep going back and forth. Is he a good guy? Is he kind of a creep that's pushy? Like, I don't know. Like, I'm just not a fan of how they use his character there. I will say, last thing, Alyssa Rose does a good job with her facial expressions conveying, you know, emotion or lack thereof. And I really think, like, for not saying a whole lot, she's the best character in the movie. And I'm not just saying that because Nico's met her and we tried to get her on. She's been very nice and gracious, just haven't quite worked out schedule-wise. I'm saying that because she's the best actor in the film to me <laughs> as far as her overall performance goes. So, yeah, you know, like you mentioned, a forgettable set of scenes, but uh, I did have a little bit to say at least on this one. So when Angela got hit with that water balloon, you would think that damn thing was filled with concrete. She dropped Holy Got shit. <laughs> and then, Brian, you talked about Mel uh, being a red herring. Yeah, yeah, that's one way to look at him. But also, what a shitty camp counselor. He's letting kids have a water balloon fight on a roof. What the fuck is going on? What, what kind of Mel's camp is like this? The, Mel's like the owner, isn't he? Or he's like the one running the whole thing. Yeah, well, whatever he is, he's running it. Crazy. He's in charge. He should have got those kids off the damn roof. I don't know. Um, the bees. What the hell, What kind of bees were those? Not only did they kill him within a minute, but he also had, like, they burrowed into his skin. He had huge ga- gaping holes in his skin after a few bee stings within minutes. Like, holy shit, what, what? I don't know, this must have been the murder hornets they tried to tell us about a few years ago. And then Paul, what a horn dog. Like, he's, he's filling up Angela, trying to get it there, but when she says she's not ready, he just goes off and starts French and Judy in the woods. It's a lot to unpack in this set of scenes. And then, like I mentioned, Mel, he's the worst... I don't know, supervisor of a camp of all time. Holding Ricky while they throw Angela in the water as she's yelling she can't swim. Like, what a dickhead. This is, holy shit, shut this place down and save me the remaining 25 minutes. (laughs) All right, guys, here's the ending. Ronnie tells the other counselors about the schedule for tonight. Meg walks up to Mel saying she has a night off. She asks about, she asks about that dinner at his place. He says, nine, nine thirty. She says she'll be there, and he smiles creepily. Meg tells Judy she has a secret date. She goes to take a shower, but the line is long. Meg goes next door to shower. She's humming and washing until we see someone enter the cabin. She backs up in the shower, and a knife is stabbed through the wall and into her back. The knife is pulled down her back, and the killer turns the shower off, washing the blood off the blade. Eddie has some campers set up and goes to find firewood. Angela asks Paul where Ricky is, and Paul apologizes again. She walks off, and Paul says he hates Judy. He begs for forgiveness. Meet me at the waterfront after the social, she says. A camper tells Eddie he wants to go back. He's cold. Others say they want to go back, too. He agrees and tells them to go to the car. POV shot walks up in the sleeping campers, and he finds a hatchet. Mel walks into the canteen asking for Meg. He's told to check her bunk and leaves to do so. Mike hides under Judy's bed as Mel walks into the room. She tells Mel she went next door to shower. He goes next door, and Mike leaves out of fear of being caught. Meg's dead body falls out the shower and Mel is horrified. Not you, Meg. He blames Ricky and asks her for forgiveness. Judy is curling her hair until someone opens the door. She can't make out who it is and says, don't turn the light on. The person walks up and Molly whops her. Judy has a pillow put over her face and a curling iron shoved into her genitalia, killing her. Judy is hidden below her bed. Eddie returns and finds the dead campers vomiting at the site. He cries for help, running back to the camp. Jeff lets Ricky grab a snack and the lights go out in the social. Mel grabs Ricky and drags him into the woods. He smacks him and hits him repeatedly. Got him, just like I promised, Meg. Mel says he has to get away. He stops in an arrow range and says, it can't be you, and he's shot through the throat. Cop is back and Ronnie tells him a killer is loose. They split up into pairs to look. Paul is at the waterfront waiting on Angela. She has to go swimming and tells him to take his clothes off. Cop finds Ricky on the ground, badly beaten up but still alive. They carry him out of the woods until they hear a scream. They found Meg's dead body. Ronnie and Susie call for the missing kids, and Ronnie hears some singing. They find Angela lying on the beach, humming, humming, holding Paul's head in her lap. They ask if she's okay. Flashback to Martha's house, and we now see Angela wasn't the child who survived. It was Peter who lived, and Martha dressed him up as Angela. Paul's head falls to the ground, and Angela stands up naked with an evil look on her face. Ronnie and Susie are in shock. She's, she's a boy. The screen turns green and the end credits roll. Brian, that's the ending. What'd you think about it? All right. Well, that's, I don't know. This is a pretty fucked up entire third act to me. I mean, there's more pedo insinuation with Meg and Mel 
And now we have Judy with, you know, the older counselor again, very clearly going to have underage sex between a dude that looks like 25 and, and like Mike mentioned and Judy having to be around what, 15 or something, you know, an old man male than beating the fuck out of a 13 year old. I mean, look, I have a 13 year old. I get it. But that's the least of my worries about this movie, because like, what the fuck with all this pedo shit? I'm sorry, Robert Hilzik, but there's just too much in here with with this entire thing for me not to question you as a writer here. I guess we'll never have him on the, the, the show now, but oh, darn, I guess we'll never get to talk about that amazing career of his and producing this and toxic to do whatever the fuck that is. But anyway, like I said. This scene with the little kids was always way out of place to me and made no sense until I watched that YouTube review and kind of explained why they, you know, they got killed for this last set of scenes with them throwing sand on Angela. So props to the movie for having the balls to kill kids, though. That I'll say that. But then we get a follow up to that with Judy getting killed by a curling iron being put up her pussy. Like who? Uh, Least least of my worries, but here we go. Who's curling their hair at bedtime anyway? I don't know, weird. But in fact, Jane Krakowski, 30 Rock, National Lampoon's Vacation, just a ton of stuff. If the name doesn't sound familiar to you, her face would, like you would definitely recognize her. But she was originally cast as Judy, dropped the role, though, once she learned of Judy's death, and she found it too fucked up, like the way it was written. But it ended up, it ended up like the final, the final thing here not being as bad because, like I said, the MPAA made them cut a lot of this shit. So to kind of go back to what Mike was talking about earlier and wondering about, I know that this was the MPAA cutting it. So maybe it was a mixture of that and the budget, like you mentioned. Um, but so this this ending, I mean, it's it's pretty well known that Felissa Rose's mom wouldn't let her wear a strap on like originally intended. Yeah, again. Robert Hilzik wanted Felissa Rose standing there naked as a 13-year-old wearing a strap-on. That's what was intended. Okay. Instead, we get body double Archie Liberace in his first and only screen credit, who doesn't even claim this apparently, but he stands there butt-ass naked wearing an Angela mask and shows full frontal. Like, I don't think you could get more fucked up than this right here. It's, okay, well, it's definitely shocking and we will go with memorable. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I'll just end on this this police uh, detective or lieutenant or whoever the hell, the policeman that's got this fucking mustache at the beginning. Great mustache at the beginning, and then I guess he shaved it off before they did these reshoots. This may be the worst, single worst mustache I've ever seen in my entire life. It's like two pieces of electrical tape on each side. It's not even close to being looking good, so I don't just somebody else go. Jesus Christ. No, I completely agree. The ending is memorable, but that doesn't make it good or okay. Like in hindsight, like all the stuff you just read off is so fucked up and, and, and just not like, I don't like how I don't like, you know, you may remember the fact that you ate this soup, but all the ingredients that went into the soup are pretty fucking terrible. So, like, it's kind of memorable for the wrong reason, but it did make it a cult concept, like I said. Look, my man Mel here, another pedo vibe. Why is he so excited for this really young-looking chick to come in here and have a date with him? That's weird. Um, I don't like the shower stab here because it's, to me, the worst, like, shot and acted kill of the whole film. Like, there's, it's like they took a page out of Psycho's book but made it worse, so I don't really understand uh, I would not have forgiven Paul. Clearly, there's more motive there. But just in the in the general sense, fuck that guy. He shouldn't have went off and made out with someone else. Like Gus mentioned, a super fucking horn dog. But uh, clearly, she's up to something. Uh, anytime Mel gives advice, which she does to Judy here, would not take advice from Mel, clearly, since he was about to go on a date with a teenager. Um, look, again, the acting from the the girl that plays Judy, I hate to criticize acting because I'm not an actor, but it's fucking terrible. The kill is weird. A curling iron up a vagina is just a very weird whole deal to me. I will say I like this arrow to the throat kill for Mel. I'm a big fan of that in any movie. Uh, I know that Nico's seen that we need to talk about Kevin, how they show the kills in that with the arrows. Like I'm a big fan of that kill. Be That's a very creative kill. So I, I did like that. This cop has the single worst fucking mustache I have ever seen in my whole life. 
Uh, and I've seen some bad mustaches, but this is just the drizzling shit. It's taped on. It's awful. It could have done a little bit better than that. I understand the twist ending being memorable. And it is shocking, especially the first time you ever see it. You're like, what the fuck? And the reveal, I really like it. It's a clever reveal. Just don't know if we needed to see the penis thing. Like, I don't know if that was necessary. Like, the twist itself is fine. The reveal is a little funky to me, like Brian already touched on, so I won't hit, hit it over the head there. But again, all in all, it's it's fun for what it is. But as we, you know, sit here and talk about it, out of context, it's so weird. You know, while you're watching it, you don't really think of these things. But when we sit here and talk about it, I'm like, man, this movie was just pretty fucking strange. So... You mentioned how uh, poorly acted the the shower stab was, but to me, the more uh, the more bizarre thing is how th- paper thin those walls were in the shower. <laughs> yeah, that was shit terrible. was made out of poster board. What the hell was that? <laughs> Construction paper. And then homeboy, or not home? Yeah, I guess homeboy. It turns out uh, washing the knife off. Like didn't even wash all the blood off. Just kind of like stick it in the water and then find there's still blood on. What the okay. Uh, Angela telling Paul, uh, Paul's begging us to meet her at the waterfront. It's a good way to plant the seed that she's the killer. So that's when I was like, ah, okay, okay. Uh, and then, you know, something else <clears throat> I realized that I hate that a lot of movies do is when Mel walks in and he walks over to Susie at the social and he starts talking to her, the two guys beside her, they're moving their mouths like they're talking, but you can't hear a word they're saying. But when Mel talks, like you hear him clearly. And then when Mel walks off, they start moving their mouths again like they're talking to you. I hate, I don't know why. That's just a big pet peeve of mine. It just gets my nerves. It's stupid. Um, what's even more stupid, though, is when Mel walked into the shower room, Meg just happened to fall in. Like, how long was her dead body just standing in the shower like that? And this little monologue there was awful, terrible. Uh, then, man, hell of a right hook to Judy's face. <laughs> I was like, holy shit, what a punch. Uh, but not nearly as hellacious as the punches Mel landed on Ricky. Overham hammer fist to a kid. Jesus Christ, this guy's awful. He deserved that arrow through the throat. That was kind of a cool shot. Uh, but then the ending. What the fuck? Like a twist is one thing. But it was kind of stupid to me. Like we didn't need to see a kid's pecker, first of all. And wh- why was he butt ass naked? Like uh, that's the only way they could let us know that, oh, this is actually a boy. That's the only way. You had to show his dick. Okay. Uh, and then why did he just stand there with his mouth wide open like that, making that weird growling noise? Like, if that's how it ends, okay, man. That's that's all I need to see. The, chalk this one up to uh, never watch again. All right, guys. Any final thoughts before you just jump into social media? Y'all bear with me. We got a lot of them. All right, let's jump on Twitter first. Go Dogs, Randy Smith. Can't wait to hear y'all's take on this one. Where to start? This is a horrible but awesome movie with an ending you will never, ever forget. A solid pick for Mike, even though I'm a little upset with him and Dustin for not letting us, the lateral pod fans, know it's over. P.S. Go dogs. Y'all broke Randy's heart, guys. <laughs> Sorry, Randy. Uh, Sorry, man. Sorry about that. They're too busy stacking up that cash right now. Drunk and Shit, impossibly tan. <laughs> Drunk and impossibly tan tweeted us saying, what is your favorite fashion choice? Oh, definitely the crop tops, man. I, I don't know. I think it's the... Uh... The booty shorts that dudes were wearing playing softball. What the fuck is this? What What is going on? 1983, dudes got their cheeks out. Hey, 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 hey. Hey, sky's out, thighs out, brother. Uh, That's right. (laughs) Sean Irwin commented, I really didn't get the hype for this movie. I thought it was just okay. Okay. I'm I'm surprised to hear uh, Sean say that. And Andrew Ferguson commented, it wouldn't be summer camp without weenies. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Let's go over to Instagram now. Kevin's that was killing. a good one. Oh, no, I Kevin's, died laughing when I heard that. Yeah, that was, that was a good one. <laughs> Kevin Scanlon would comment on Instagram, I watched this for the first time a couple of years ago. Not a bad movie overall, but the twist ending is what truly makes this film. I'm glad I got to experience it without without it being spoiled for me. I will never forget putting this on, and my sister, definitely not a horror fan, asked me, is this Sleepaway Camp? She then proceeded to sit down and watch with me because I told her I hadn't seen it. Should have known right then, and she just wanted to stick around for my reaction to the ending. Solid pick, Mike. I give this one a 7.5. Okay. Jesse Craft commented, oh, my God, this movie. So bad is good with the hands-up emoji. Gail Snell, 
Oh my God, you're really doing this one. Okay, Artie, he's the villain monster of this entire movie. Seriously, fuck that guy. Now we're talking about the actual movie. I think it's an 80s must-see. The acting is shitty and over the top. That's really the movie for me. Just pure over-the-top 80s horror. The plot twist at the end, nobody can tell me it's not an inspiration for M. Night. I think the premise of the movie is original, and it maintains amazing 80s horror movie tropes, with the exception of Artie. This movie is a must-watch. Okay. Jay Hambrick, 88. I love this movie. Camp is my favorite scenery for a horror movie. I can respect that for sure. Elbow.Tyler. Nice catch, Moats. Do you guys think Ricky was an accomplice? Also, I wish they explained why Peter Baker wasn't raised by the other dad in the intro. Only one of them was ran over, right? That's a good question. But I would say, heck, they, they might have just been secret lovers. I mean, I don't, I don't know. That's my yeah, guess I mean, for that. I took yeah. it as the dad was, yeah, like, I guess the dad was divorced, had these two kids. Maybe it right. wasn't on the weekend. And obviously he was divorced because, you know. He was a homosexual, yes. Which, by the way, the first, I didn't remember that. When I went back and walked, like I was like, "Oh damn, I forgot about that." Because I've seen the movie twice before, and I just it just slipped through the fingers there that that was the thing. <laughs> Danny Cnap's coming finally, y'all. I love this movie. Is it good? Not really. Is it problematic? Oh yes. There's just something about it that I love, and that ending though. Can't wait for this one, guys. I feel you on that. Chris underscore twenty twenty. Man, the last five minutes with the reveal of music still get me. Due to, due to the whole uncanny valley nature of the Angela mask and lifeless eyes staring, terrifying nightmare fuel. Now, if someone found this in real like this happened to him in real life, that would be, definitely be some nightmare fuel. Oh, yeah. All right. Alex, one comment. Poor, poor Judy. I'm not saying she didn't deserve her, her comeuppance, but, but the suggested manner of her demise was so shocking. If my old ass ever goes to a Halloween party again, I'm 100% wearing a wig with a side ponytail. A pink shirt that says Judy and Daisy Dukes with a curling iron sticking out of the back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, brother. That's what I'm talking about. All right, Facebook, and then we're almost done. Samantha Davidson, great choice. One thing I've always wondered about this film is, where do they get the pot for the kitchen scene? It's so tall, it's ridiculous. There's no way you could really cook anything. In it. No way to stir point. it properly. Eat shit and live. <laughs> oh, they would have had to fucking stir it with a shovel. Like, there's no... You're absolutely right. Yeah. Joe Swift for coming. I hate how much I love this movie, but a few highlights from yours truly. Judy deserved worse. How was Ricky's mom a doctor? Chick was absolutely Looney Tunes. The cover art is fire. Shameless picture inserted. And has the best line of all time. Eat shit and die, Ricky. Eat shit and live, Bill. It does have some great lines in it. And the last comment we have is love Hold this on, one. Hold on. Before you continue, two things I wanted to respond to Joe about. Number one, I hate how much you like this movie too as well. Joe, it's weird. And number two, the cover art you mentioned, I really meant to bring that up. Like the the drawing of Angela on that poster, if you go back and look at it, is so eerily similar to what Eleven from Stranger Things looks like. It's a crazy if you go look at it. I was like, oh, my God, is that Eleven from Stranger Things? It's crazy. But, yeah, great cover art. Sorry. Yeah, I love the cover art. And the last comment we have is from Joey Keene. Love this one. When my brother and I were kids, like eight or nine, we convinced our grandma to rent it for us on a sleepover. <laughs> She watched it with us. For unknown reasons, she flipped out at the end. <laughs> I can understand that. That's all social media. Brian, Dustin, y'all got fun facts? I only I have two. Um, Felissa Rose was only 13 when she was uh, filming this. And uh, the other one, as a child, writer-director Robert Hiltzik actually went to the camp used in the film. So I got, I don't have fun facts or anything, but I do have a question. Like, it's interesting to me, the uh, poster for this movie features what's clearly an Adidas shoe. Like, the, you know, there's only one shoe brand with three stripes. But in some some uh, versions of the poster, one of the stripes is edited out, and there's only two stripes. So I'm wondering I'm wondering if they just, like, <laughs> said, fuck it, we're just doing it, or if Adidas, like, shut that shit down. I'm wondering how that came to be. I'm Probably so pro- uh, Adidas probably said we don't want to be associated with this yeah. with this naked dick. What are we doing? Nor do I. Nor do I. <laughs> All day I dream about sleepaway camp. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so just really quick, we touched on the budget a ton. Uh, the budget for this movie was only three hundred fifty thousand dollars, which is uh, that's that's wow. fucking beans and more beans. Like that is really really shoestring, but it grossed. Eleven million dollars. Damn the budget and the gross. That is insane. 
No wonder it became a quote unquote cult classic with sequels. Cause I mean, if I'm putting 350,000 down and I get 11 million back, yeah, man, I'm going to make some more of these motherfuckers because they're printing money. Yeah. Can't argue with that. Let's jump to our favorites, uh, favorite part of the show, favorite kill, least favorite kill in the rating. Mike, did you say you wanted to kick us off this week? I sure will, man. Let's go. Uh, normally I go last, but I'm going to go first. So, hey, Ricky Bobby vibes. Let's go. That's right. Came <laughs> first, relax. My, uh, I can't believe I'm going to do this because you guys are going to hate, hate this. But my favorite kill was the bees, man. I thought it was fucking hilarious. Jesus. I love how it looks after the fact. And I don't know. <laughs> there's just something about it that made me laugh and made me love the kill. It's illogical. I'm not arguing that it's logical. I'm just arguing that I enjoyed the kill a ton. My, it looks good. Least, I'm going to say Exactly. my li- And it shot really well, too. Just, you know, slide out under the stall there would have been smart. But my least favorite kill is actually the stab in the shower, which I talked about, because we have so many stabs in the showers in the movies that follow that are done way better. And like that's to mention, the walls are made out of construction paper and all this other stuff. And I'm just I'm just not a big fan. So anyway, look, it's not that the movie is bad itself. I'm just viewing it through a lens of 2023. And some of the effects and the acting and other things just do not hold up well. But it's campy. It's fun. It's not the worst movie we've done, at least in my opinion. That would be rubber. Uh, I, if I had to retroactively up the score of things killing, I would because rubber is significantly worse. So anyway, uh, look, it's not even close to those movies, in my opinion. It can be fun if you turn your brain off and don't think about all the little things that are wrong with it. So, again, Lisa Rose gives a solid performance. And I think the premise and plot are as, as solid as any other horror movie. Like it's at a camp, it's a summer camp, there's kids, there's, you know, people being killed, like pretty standard paint by numbers plot there. So there's a lot of, like Dustin said, do not pause here, a lot of meat on the bone. And I do think there's more you can make out of it than they did. Although with the budget, I'm willing to forgive it a little bit. I have fun. It's not my favorite. So I gave it a 5.25. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you guys. My favorite and least favorite kill, I don't know which ones are my favorite because, I mean, what do you go? Favorite kill, I'm going to choose Mel getting shot through the neck. They, uh, I, I watched the Sleepaway Camp documentary this morning. It's kind of cool how they pulled the uh, how, how they pulled that, that kill off, and the effects are really good. Least favorite kill, I know which one it is. I'm going to go with Kenny. The after part it looks good, and, you know, pulling the canoe off of him, snake crawls out of his mouth, but like Dustin said, Bro just gave up, got dunked underwater. He's like, fuck it, I'm just going to die tonight, I guess. Didn't put up no fight. Just, just, you know, be a man. Good Lord. Where's the where's the Boston guy at? He, he needed to watch some TikToks. All right, I kind of touched on how I felt about the movie at the beginning. I'll just, you know, be short and sweet here. Met Felissa Rose. She's super nice. Uh, no one has capitalized on a role in a movie more than her and made something out of it. She's She does, like Brian's mentioned, we've had her scheduled. She's agreed to come on our show several times. But she's doing a convention every other week, it seems like, and just does not have time. So hopefully in the future we will have her on and talk about it. Uh, I think the movie is fun. I don't think it's uh, – I mean, the acting is bad. It's cringy a little bit, but I have a good time watching it. Is it the masterpiece? Absolutely not. But is it something I'll watch maybe once a year during the summertime if it's free on Peacock or something? Yeah. I gave it a 575. Wow. All right. Um, so my my least favorite kill was the B kill – uh, and the best, my favorite kill, I don't know. Uh, the boiling water on Artie wasn't a kill, but it's better to me than any of the real kills. So I'm just going to go with that. Um, again, I like this a lot better than I used to, not to say that I really quote unquote like it. Uh, I know it seems, you know, basically seems like I shit on this movie the entire time, but I do like and respect a lot that it does. The atmosphere, I think, is great having the guts to kill kids and show kids in a realistic way. Like I mentioned, like John Hughes, but there's too much pedo shit here for me to let it go. Has me questioning writer, director, Robert Hilzik. Uh, but I did give it a 5.25. Okay. Okay. So, um, my favorite kill is Bill, like an arrow to the throat after assaulting a kid. He deserved that shit. And also just like arrow through the throat's cool. Least favorite kill was, I, you know, I guess the kids that were killed off screen, um, I I guess or Kenny being drowned without uh without a fight that one that one takes the kick that one takes the kick actually I'm gonna go with that. Yeah. Uh, 
as far as my thoughts on the movie, man, it's just the acting's horrible. The special effects aren't great, which I get it. Limited budget. Uh, the twist is weird and, and <laughs> included implied underage nudity, which is unnecessary. Uh, it does have its charm, but it comes in spurts and it's few and far between. I gave the movie a uh, 2.5. So, so that gives us a uh, composite score of 4.6875. IMDb has it as a 6.2. I don't know how in God's green earth, but, you know, teach their own. <laughs> man, IMDb is nice to those classic horror movies, man. I don't know how in God's green earth, Creature from the Black Lagoons, anything above a one. But, you know, Jesus. this is me. Also, I'd like to point out, I think you three are trolling me because I told you both. I told you all in the group chat. If anyone rates this above a five, I'm judging you. And you all three gave it decimal points above a five. Hey, man, I didn't I didn't reply back to that comment. I, I had my rating in my head already. That was intentional, buddy. Yeah, I know I was it was. Not. I know it was. I honestly yeah. didn't even. I must have missed that text. It Control like, it like a I boat motor, baby. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, brother. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, I'm going to shout out our blood donors. I'm going to announce my pick for next week. Really appreciate all of our blood donors. It takes a big burden off of us. Our camper level reoccurring are Clayton J, Nina, Michelle Mirza, Andrew Ferguson, the Horror Movie Crew Podcast, Alex Elgson, Eric Doolittle, Sean Irwin, Brian Samick, Trisha, and Kelsey Miller. Camp Council reoccurring are Dennis Kennedy, Edwin Hernandez Gunn, Joe Swinford, Jennifer Davis from the Too Close to Home Pod, Kyla Denise, all the way from Australia, Adrian Aiello. Karen, Matt Strickland, Gail Koontz, and the greatest Instagram username of all time, Optional 13th Ghost. Shout out to all of y'all. We really appreciate all your help. Uh, next week, I chose Home Invasion for myself, a big Home Invasion movie fan. Uh, this is a movie that Mike, you know, Mike's picked this week. It was a little overdue, I think. This one might be a little bit overdue. I think this is one of the best yep. Home Invasion horror movies out there. Uh, I chose 2011's Your Next. Uh, really excited to cover it, and it's going to be fun to talk about. Brian, uh, Dustin, Thank have you me. seen this one yet? No, I'm about to watch it today, actually. Hell, All yeah. Right. I can't wait to hear what you think. I'm excited for. <laughs> I'm excited to review it. I think this is a really good home invasion movie. Uh, appreciate all our fan support. You guys are awesome. Uh, y'all have a good one. Just want to remind everybody. Uh,